Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. It is the first Sunday of September, so we are going to be having the Lord's Supper as part of our service today. So if you'd like to participate in communion uh, and you don't have some elements nearby, I would suggest maybe you go grab some right now so that you can be a part of that time in our service. Uh, today is also special because we are going to be beginning a new preaching series. Pastor Lou is going to be beginning walking through the book of Romans. and We are incredibly excited about that. So if you don't have a Bible ready around you or maybe one on a device nearby, you can certainly uh, go to the lower right hand part of your screen and there's a tab that says Bible and you will be able to track along there as we begin our journey through the book of Romans. Wherever in the world you may be, thank you so much for being with us this morning. God bless you. Let's go to our worship service. Christ says, come to me, 
all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. us to come into your holy presence and accepting us as we are. We lay our burdens at the foot of the cross today, Lord, and look forward to what you have to teach us here. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. Special welcome to those that are watching online. Just a few announcements to keep in front of you next Sunday, 3 o'clock over at Camp Spofford, we're having a church-wide event that we call Encounter, and you are all invited to come. It's going to be a time of fun. I think we're lining up some baptisms to be done in the lake as well, so we certainly do encourage you all to be a part of that. Uh, dinner is also going to be available, so the camp is going to be putting that on for us. It is $10 per person. We're capping it off at $40 for a family, and we do need you to sign up for that so they know exactly how much food to buy and prepare. And the way to do that is to go to our website, www.gracefreechurch.org, and then go to in the top section there to Grace News, and once the newsletter opens up, there'll be something about Encounter, and then you can register there as well. But today is the last day in order to register for dinner. So uh, we would encourage you, encourage you to do that to be a part of uh, this event next 
Sunday, starting at 3 o'clock over at camp. Uh, anybody that is interested in our marriage ministry called Reengage, that's going to be starting up pretty soon, and uh, Beth Chance is going to be out in the foyer after the service if you have any questions about what that may look like. But I certainly encourage um, any of you couples out there thinking about um, doing this to consider doing it. It's a wonderful experience, and it's a great time to get to know other people in the church as well. Uh, last announcement is this. Let me preface it by saying we're about to have a PG-13 uh, conversation, and but I'm not ashamed of that because the church has something to say about these things that are happening in our world um, that we need to talk about and be aware of. We put a priority on solid biblical teaching here at the church, but we trust that solid biblical teaching leads to solid biblical thinking, which leads to solid biblical action. And there are things that the church should be standing up for, and we need to know about them. So I'm going to invite Jeannie Pride and Gordy Christensen to come on up. And uh, so on uh, September 23rd at 6.30, we're having a speaker here, um, Jasmine Grace, uh, in, the, in the name of the event is called Trafficked, Recovered, and Redeemed. So Jeannie, this has been a burden on your heart for a while, uh, human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking. How, how did that come about? I'm like most of you, I knew about sex trafficking over in Thailand and other places like that. Um, but when I was my first year at Soul Fest being a vendor, when I walked around, there were three organizations that were um, talking about sex trafficking, helping to, uh, us to understand the realities of it. And I started reading, I started attending conferences, and I realized that I had been very judgmental of those that were involved in sex trafficking. Um, 90%, almost 90% of people who are involved in prostitution want to be doing something else. They want to get out of it, but they don't know how. The other thing is I was a high school teacher for 29 years. Someone asked me once, were any of my kids, my students traffic? I don't know. I didn't know what the signs were. I didn't know what the risk factors were. I did not know what to look for. Um, it's important that we're involved in being aware of sex trafficking. It happens everywhere. It happens here in our country. It happens in our area. I'm also part of the State Task Force for Human Trafficking. And in our last report, there were 84 children that were receiving services of counseling who had been identified as sex trafficking. And those kids' ages raised from 0 to 17. Now, the other thing is that we want to be concerned for our grandchildren. But I believe that God tells us in Proverbs 31, 8, that we are to speak up for those that do not have a voice. Most of these people, no one is looking for. So on the 23rd, Jasmine Grace is coming, and we're expecting to hear her story, but what are other things that we can be expecting on that evening? Okay, her story is also going to be about her redemption and how the church was really involved in that, which is really important. Uh, we're also going to be having cards that you can make for other survivors that are in, in homes across the country. By the way, um, it's between 30 and 50% are also males that are, are trafficked. Oftentimes you don't hear as much about that. Um, I'm going to make books for sale. We'll have refreshments, all those kind of things. And then about three weeks afterwards, we're going to have another survivor speak. Um, she's going to be going into much more detail about it and how we become more involved. So when we come on the 23rd, we're coming to celebrate a redemption story, but also to be informed, to learn about how these things are happening in our own neighborhoods, in Keene and in Brattleboro, in these areas, not just in big cities. So, Gordy, as head of the men's ministry, why is this something that our men should be aware of as well? Men of grace, without a doubt, have been called to be spiritual leaders of their home, to be providers and protectors. The unfortunate thing about this human trafficking and sex trafficking is so many of us know so little about it. To be uninformed and to be ignorant is not going to be a valid excuse when it comes to protecting our children. The reason that I am asking that the men of grace attend this meeting is to find out what is going on right under your nose that may be happening right inside your house as men seek to worm into your children's iPad, their iPhone, or whatever other tool that this social media environment 
tries to bring the children in, teenagers, whatever. This girl that you see behind me, her name is Cora Grace Christensen. She's my four-year-old granddaughter. I worry about her because she is growing up in a world with threats that we never knew about, where men and people would seek to draw her in to a lifestyle that we would shudder to even think about. She will become a teenager. The ages of 13 and 14 are the prime ages for this type of activity. I worry about her. I want the men of grace to be aware of what they need to look for. This picture was taken five days ago on her first day to pre-K. She got on the first step of the bus. She turned around and ran back to her daddy and said, I need one more hug. <laughs> men, grandfathers, your children, your daughters need that love and that hug from you. Because when I had my first daughter, my wife said to me, she said, Gordon, you need to love on Caitlin. She needs to be affirmed by you and loved by you because if she doesn't get that love and attention from you, she will seek it from another male. So gentlemen, I invite you, I implore you, if you can make this meeting at all, find out what is going on so that we can be the salt and the earth that God has called, uh, salt and the light that God has called us to. So September 23rd, 630 here at the church, we encourage you all to come out and learn more about this so that we can be informed and as believers, we could take a, ta uh, take a stand against this evil that is taking place all around us. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Romans. It's going to be the first two verses of the first chapter, and we're going to say it together. Uh, it's going to be up here on the screen. Pastor Lou is going to be beginning a brand new series in the book of Romans. So let's read uh, these first two verses together from Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which is promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Good morning, church. I'm Dave Wheeler. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been a elder at the church here for a few years, but I just want to welcome you all here and uh, invite you all to pray with me this morning. Uh, Father in heaven, we love you, Lord. Um, we want to acknowledge the fact that this is your world. Uh, you created this place. Uh, you created all the laws, the foundational truths that exist, mathematics, physics, chemistry. That's all from your mind. You created it, Lord. Um, and I want to acknowledge the fact that we are eternal beings standing, sitting in this room, Lord. All of us people on earth are eternal. Um, we had a creative moment, and then we will go on and on forever. Um, yet this world is temporary. We're here for a quick breath in the grand scheme of things, Lord. Um, we're like a, a candle in the wind. Um, and one day we are going to die. We are going to be snuffed out, Lord. Um, and our situation is quite precarious, God, as we are in a, a situation of sin, Lord. Um, we don't have to teach our children to sin. They learn how to do that all by themselves. Um, so, you know, we all take part in that. And uh, our biggest sin is against you, our eternal creator, and your will. Um, God, that makes our, our sin pretty, pretty bad, um, pretty heavy, um, pretty expensive, um, and, and, and terrible, um, God. You, you know, this, this is something that we cannot deal with on our own, um, and it's crushing. The weight of it is crushing, but Lord, you took care of that through your son, Jesus Christ, who was perfect and infinitely good. He came and lived an infinitely perfect life, and he died even though he didn't deserve to die. Because your word says, uh, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But Christ never sinned, yet he still allowed 
that death to happen, and that's because he allowed it to be a substitutionary payment for us so that we could be made pure and holy. Our infinite debt could be infinitely scrubbed away by his infinite sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for taking care of that big picture problem that we have. Thank you for sacrificing your son, and thank you um, for doing it on our behalf, even when we didn't love you and we, when we wanted to do it our way, when we wanted to do, live for ourselves and for our good pleasure and for our, what we think is best. But no, you, you died for us when we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us is what your word says. So thank you, God. And we thank you for the book of Romans. Thank you for the opportunity to go through it with Lou. Um, God, we want to pray for the Winchester family, um, for the family of Greggy Hecht, who passed away recently, Lord. Please be with them. Bless them and help them. Because, yes, we are eternal beings, and when someone dies who is close to us, it feels like we were robbed. Uh, that's why I know that the atheists are wrong, Lord. So when someone dies that, that I care about, it feels wrong. It feels like I was robbed, like some, someone was taken from me prematurely. And I know that's how they're feeling right now. So we pray that you would give them peace, help them through this very difficult time, Lord. Pray that you would um, just bless the remainder of our service. Bless the people here today, Lord, the people listening online. Uh, I pray that your spirit would come alongside them, help them to know you love them, you love them, you care about them. Um, and that you would, you would not want to see them continue in their situation, but you've provided a, a way out for them. You've provided substitution. You've provided um, forgiveness for them through the blood of Jesus Christ. It was a costly effort on your part. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ promises to be our all in all. He promises to be everything that we need. He's the all-sufficient one. So let's make it a point to find our joy in him today. Because he's enough.
Our Father, our hearts do cry out, hallelujah. Thank you for the provision of salvation that you've given to us through your Son. And now we ask that you'd bless this study of the book of Romans, which lays out so clearly what we are all about as a church and what this world needs. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. Many of you know that <clears throat> I am living in the house where I started my life. Uh, we moved into that house when I was just a little baby, and my family lost the house for a few years, but when I graduated from college, I had the opportunity to buy it back. And when my wife and I moved in there in 1981, one of my first projects was to fix a porch roof that had been leaking for years, and so I quickly just cut some new boards to replace the rotting ones, but I noticed before I put them in that there was a little cavity or space uh, underneath the roof in between the ceiling of the porch. And so I grabbed an old Gideon Bible and I wrote a short history of my family and the years that we had been at the house and, and uh, put a message of the gospel and some verses for them to look up in the Bible, hoping that whoever found it would look it up and become a Christian. And then I put a PS on it that I was about ready to have my first child, and then I wrapped it up in plastic, put it in the hole, put the boards down, and put the roof on. Well, years went by, and I kind of forgot about it. And at the end of the 1990s, I had some work done on that porch to screen it in, and the contractor uh, T said that we needed to replace the whole roof because it was so shaky, and so I said, go ahead. And I was working in my kitchen doing some things when one of the contractors came running up and banging on the door and with this book, and he said, I found this that some old man put in the hole of the roof. <laughs> and I was immediately excited because I thought, well, maybe my father left us something to remember him by, and as I unwrapped it and opened it, I realized I'm the one who put that there. <laughs> After having a good laugh about it, I updated it a little bit and redated it, and then I set her again and put her back in the hole. Well, a similar feeling of excitement must have hit the child king Josiah, according to an Old Testament text found in 2 Chronicles 34. Josiah, you might know, ascended the throne of Israel during a time when biblical worship and the importance of the temple had been neglected by the previous kings, Ammon and Manasseh. For over 60 years, Israel had abandoned the Hebrew scriptures and substituted it with false worship. Josiah was born and raised by a nurse and a priest who used to tell him bedtime stories about the good old days when Israel followed God. And when Josiah became king at the age of eight, he desired to rekindle the faith of Israel, but he didn't know where to start. And so he got rid of some of the worship centers of the false gods, but it took him another decade or so before he then turned his attention to the temple that had not been used and was just a gigantic storage space. And he commanded that it be cleaned out. And in 2 Chronicles 34, we find that they found some money and they found something greater than silver and gold. For Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law written by Moses. And he brought it before the king and Shaphan and, and, and the priest read it to Josiah. And his reaction was he ripped his clothes in repentance because he realized how long it had been since Israel had obeyed God. The word of God was lost in the very house of God. And I could get off into a tangent about the modern church in that regard, but that's a sermon unto itself. But the discovery of the books of Moses sparked a revival that went down in history for Israel. Josiah was a godly king, and he began upholding the covenant, and great prosperity came as he obeyed God. Now, I want to say that any portion of scripture that is read and understood and acted upon will produce a change in those who obey it. But I think an argument could be made that God has used the book of Romans more than any other book to spark revival in the church. 
beginning in the third century AD, a corrupt individual by the name of Augustine was walking around in a garden and he heard the voice of some children playing and the child said, take up and read, take up and read. Well, he saw a book lying on a table because his mother was a Christian and it was a Bible and he went to it and he opened it to Romans chapter 13, verse 13, which says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. It was at that very moment that he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ and was marvelously saved. Many of you are familiar with the name Martin Luther, several hundred years later. He was a man devoted to the Roman Catholic Church. And at one point in his career, he was assigned to teach a class in the newly opened University of Wittenberg. And his assignment was to teach Romans. Now, he knew no other way to study but to just take things as they read. And so he read and he studied. And he said, night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy can anybody be justified, and it's only by faith. And thereupon, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors of paradise. Thus began what we know as the Great Reformation. A couple hundred years later, John Wesley, upon searching for the meaning of faith, stumbled upon a Bible study that was taking place on Aldersgate Street, where someone was reading Luther's preface to the commentary on Romans. And when he heard Luther's story and his response to the book, he himself surrendered to Christ because of that book. Many of you may not realize that the very tradition that we are in, called the Evangelical Free Church Movement, had its birth through the Book of Romans. You see, the Protestant church had become institutionalized, and at one point there were these two men, two brothers named Robert and James Haldane, and they were sound Christians, and they moved to Geneva in Switzerland. And while there, sitting in a park and reading, Robert overheard the heathenistic conversations of two seminary students who were going to the local seminary that was founded by Calvin 200 years before that, but he was concerned and he invited them to his apartment where he wanted to open up the book of Romans to them. And so they came and he began to teach through the book, verse by verse. And consequently over a period of time, class was filled with seminary students who weren't getting anything out of the seminary classes but were getting more out of this home Bible study by Haldane. Well, almost every single one of those students dispersed after the class was over some went to France and Germany, and others went to Norway and to Sweden, which is where the Evangelical Free Church was founded. And then those Christians migrated over to America in the late 1800s, and thus we became the Evangelical Free Church of America. So listen, the founding principle of our association is that we make sure we center around the pure exposition of Scripture and not church tradition. We exist to study scripture, not the philosophies of men, not the dictates of the government, not even the dogma of the church. But as free or independent churches, we get our authority from scripture and scripture alone. That's why our byword is, where stands it written? We do things only when scripture demands it. And I could give many other examples of people who are moved by the book of Romans, but I would like to refer to myself for a moment. The book of Romans has had a profound effect upon my life as well. When I first became a Christian, and was a very young teenager, a man named Dwayne Harvey challenged me to memorize the book of Romans with him. I memorized the first six chapters over the next year and a half, as well as chapter 14. And I have to tell you that almost every day, a verse from Romans comes flashing across my mind, even when I don't want to hear it. Up until about 10 years ago, I could still recite it. But I can't seem to anymore, and I asked my doctor about it, and she said, I'm losing my mind. 
Well, if I am, I don't miss it much. <laughs> now, because the Book of Romans has influenced me so much, it has formed the foundation of our ministry, in essence, and I've taught its principles many times in informal contexts. Uh, in the 1990s, mid-1990s, we did go through it as a church, but as you know, many of you weren't here at that time. And so it's my desire to cover this book one more time before my ministry ends, if the Lord wills. Romans is loaded with topics that we need to know and are just as relevant today as they were back when it was written. In this book, Paul is going to answer questions like, is Jesus God? What is God like? How can God send people to hell? Why do people reject God? What's the Holy Spirit like? How do you live a victorious Christian life? What is the future for Israel? What does God think of certain moral behaviors? And so the topics covered cover almost every question that the inquiring Christian wants to know. Therefore, I wish to explore it together one more time with you and leave a database for this church so that we can face whatever the world's going to throw at us in the next decade. And so the book is so logical that it thrills the most intellectual, and yet it brings the dullest of minds to tears because it's so easy to understand. And here's a rough outline of each chapter. It's going to tell us that we are alienated from God, we are inexcusable before God, we are guilty of sin, and yet we can be justified. We can be at peace. We can be free from sin and free from the law. We can be an heir with God. And God was involved in Israel's past as an example of how he deals with us. He is involved in Israel's present, and he's going to be involved in Israel's future. He's not done with Israel. And then we learn in application that believers can live a life that's yielded to God. They can live in any government that they find themselves in. They can live with brothers and sisters. They can live lives of helpfulness and fruitfulness. And so we have many topics to explore. And so it is that we embark upon what I pray will be a fruitful study of the heart of the New Testament. And I pray that it will revive us, as it has many throughout the centuries, as we commit to a study in detail. And the best place to start is with an examination of the human author and the recipients. Verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Who's the author? Well, Maybe you're a new Christian and you're not familiar with Paul, but Paul wrote almost half of the New Testament. He is the one person in all of Scripture that I spend the most time with, that I, I feel the heartbeat of Paul. That was his name, Paul, but his old name was Saul, according to Acts 18.3. And he was a, uh, learned the trade of his father, who was a tent maker. He was highly intelligent and a classically trained Jew. In Philippians chapter 3, if you care to look over there, gives us a little bit about his achievements in Judaism. Verse 5 tells us that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know what that means? Out of all the 12 sons of Jacob, only Benjamin was born in the promised land, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin, and so he was a real Hebrew, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's not like some people that move here in New Hampshire when they're five years old and live here for 40 years and have the nerve to say that they are from New Hampshire. <laughs> he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul studied the law under the greatest Jewish rabbi of the time named Gamaliel. Paul was a Pharisee, which made him a conservative in his faith, and he became a scholar in his own rank. And he had zeal for Judaism. And because of that zeal, he persecuted the church of God in the name of Judaism and felt he was doing God a favor. He killed and destroyed Christian men, women, and children, all in the name of Judaism. Acts 9.31 describes him as a war horse who, smelling blood, just trampled all the more. It made him even stronger. And I want to say that if Paul had never become a Christian, he still would have gone down in human history as a famous person because of what he did as a Jew. But all this changed 
when Saul met Christ. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 9, is his first account of his conversion. Paul was walking on the road to Damascus to go and kill more Christians. And verse 3 says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And as you read on, you will find that he surrendered to the power of Christ and became a worker for him. Everything changed when he was introduced to Christ. Christ confronted him with his sin, revealed himself, and nothing was ever the same, and his name was changed to Paul. Now, back in Romans, it says, Paul became a slave of Christ. The English Standard Version renders the Greek word doulos as servant, but the legacy standard more accurately renders it slave. That's the raw meaning of doulos. You see, the English word servant and even bondservant of some translations kind of gives the idea of some sort of recompense or pay. But the raw word means someone who doesn't have ownership of their life. They are an unwilling slave, forced into bondage. And that's the way it's used consistently throughout the Hebrew scriptures, but then there is a twist in some Hebrew scriptures which indicate that there was a way that your unwilling service can become willing. And Exodus 21 is the classic passage, verses 5 through 6, where it says, if a slave wishes to stay with his master because he now loves him, he could voluntarily and willingly be a slave. But to do it, he would have to go before the elders in public and walk up to a post and an elder would take an awl, which was a leather punch, and would put the earlobe against the wall and drill it through. Now that's a kind of ear piercing I could get behind. <laughs> but it was his willingness to say, I am yours willingly from this point on. And I want to tell you that all of us have this choice of becoming, having our ears spiritually pierced. There should come a time for every serious believer when we put our ear upon the post and allow God to mark us. In fact, I want to ask you, have you experienced a time when you said to God that I would rather be a slave to you than to have all the riches in the world? I'm telling you, if you can do that, that's an experience of freedom that you will feel no other way. So this slave was also called to be an apostle. And because of his willingness to obey God, Paul shaped him and sent him forth as an apostolos. It means a sent one or an ambassador, someone representing a superior. Paul was personally and audibly called by Christ with all the authority of the other apostles. And 1 Corinthians 9, 16 says, he preached because he felt constrained. I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. You see, Paul was not some self-appointed religious spokesman. He was under compulsion to preach, and he was directly sent by the Lord. Now, there is a sense in which we are all supposed to go forth with the gospel. That's in the Great Commission. We're supposed to share the gospel. But it is equally true that not everyone who's a Christian is supposed to be a chief leader in the church. There's a story of a wise old preacher from the South who faithfully pastored in a small country church. And a young man came to preach in his church on one Sunday night, and he was a cocky, self-assured person who thought that he was more than what everybody deserved. He was so full of himself that he spoke on and on and nobody could really follow what he was saying. And when he was done, the older preacher went up to the man and said, young man, was you sent or did you just went? <laughs> you see, in other words, no one commissioned him. He commissioned himself and nobody was following him. And unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians who consider themselves spokesmen for God, 
but nobody's following them because they have not been formally called by the Lord. Furthermore, Paul is said to be set apart for the gospel of God. This one more phrase, set apart, is the word aphorizo. It's actually the word behind Pharisee. Pharisee meant somebody separated from the common people. But it's also a part of a family of words that have this, the word horizon in it. And so the term suggests a, a majestic scene where you can look at the horizon and see something that's separated from all else. Uh, for instance, I just got back from Wyoming and uh, Jackson Hole, and the place we were staying, if you sat on the back porch, the Grand Teton was right there. And on the horizon, but it mastered everything around it. And no matter how far you drove for miles, it kind of followed you around, changing just a little bit. But everything was in context of that, of what was on the horizon. And so Paul is saying that that which was on the horizon for him was the gospel of God. The thing that never got out of his sight was the gospel. And what is the gospel? It is the good news that God loves you, but equally, it's the same news that God hates sin. The two go together. God doesn't just love you. He hates sin. And because he loves you, he wants to get rid of that sin. And he did it by placing it upon his son who died upon the cross to die in your place. And then he rose from the dead to indicate that he was God and that we have the same power, the same resurrection power to live lives godly in Christ Jesus. That's the message that Paul wants to always keep on your horizon. It should govern everything you do, every decision you make. The message of the gospel is the theme of this book. If you look at chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 of Romans, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. What, what a marvelous book of scripture. And yet there is suffering that went along with Paul's being set apart. Herbert Lockyer says, as you follow Paul from country to country, mark how he suffered for Christ's sake in the mission, his missionary labors. He gives a brief list for you to ponder. He says, he endured every species of hardship, encountering every extreme danger. He was assaulted by the populace, punished by magistrates, scourged, beaten, stoned, left for dead, and he expected the same wherever he went. I mean, how did Paul put up with that? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verses 7 through 12 where Paul compares his body to a, to a garbage pail. And he says this, that we have the, this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Yes, we are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus. Now, this list could be applied to us as well. What Paul teaches us from his life is that the way we experience the power of God is through affliction, not getting out of it. He goes on to say in verses 16 through 18, we don't lose heart. Even though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We can endure physical affliction and disappointment because we know that the spiritual realm defined by the gospel is the most important subject on the earth. More important than everything working out in your personal life. More important than existence. And we must let the understanding of the future govern our present. All the afflictions that we experience here are of eternal value. They're not wasted. And I say that to you who are experiencing the loss of loved ones in these past weeks, that even that 
has an eternal benefit. So Paul could tolerate the present pain because of the surety of the future. And so can we. There was a man who had become so run down and depressed that he felt like he could no longer face life. And he supposed that something was physically wrong with him. And so he went to a doctor and the physician performed a bunch of tests, blood tests, x-rays, EKG. And when the man came in to find out the results, he saw on the clipboard at the bottom the word incopability. And he asked the physician, what does that mean? And the doctor admitted, that's a word that I made up to describe patients with your symptoms. Nothing is wrong with you physically, but you just can't seem to cope with life. And so I call it incopability. Now people, there are no hopeless situations. Only people who have grown hopeless about them because they've lost the focus of what's on the horizon and they look at their little lives without keeping it in perspective. That's the key to living a successful Christian life, keeping things in focus. Yes, the world is filled with inequities, and yet we have the promise in Scripture that if we turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, then the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seem off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Join me. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Well, Paul understood this more than any other human being, and because he did, he was able to be a willing slave, a called apostle, and totally separated unto the gospel of God. Nothing else mattered to him so much as the clear presentation of the gospel of God's righteousness which is the theme of Romans. And so this great man, enslaved to Christ, put his pen to paper, and he wrote to a particular people. Now, who are these people? Drop down to verse 7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Very clearly, he's writing to a group of people in the city of Rome. And what do you know about Rome? It was the capital of the entire known world. It was the city of the Caesars. It was at the crossroads of every other city where the Roman roads dispersed out into. And you should know that a city of this size could not house all the Christians in one spot, and they didn't have churches like that. They had house churches. And so this letter is written to all these house churches to be circulated, and there was no one particular person that it was sent to. There was no pope. Now, there's no detail in the scripture as to how that church got started, although it's probably happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You see, Jewish worshipers, especially men, w went to Jerusalem every year for these holidays. And it was there in Acts chapter 2 that Peter preached the sermon that converted many of the Jews, and probably some of them went back home to Rome, and through the Holy Spirit, they started churches. And by the way, there's no evidence that Peter started the church there personally in Rome. They got started around 50 A.D., and Peter didn't visit until 63 A.D. So most likely the church grew because Paul wrote this letter, and that was the foundation of this Roman church. And these Romans were loved by God. They were beloved so much that Paul wanted to communicate to them. He knew the strategic nature of their city, that if he could get them strong in the gospel, the whole world could be influenced. And it was. God loves the city, and cities are crucial. But so are country churches. 
they aren't any more loved. God loved them so much, he calls them saints. And this means the holy ones. It means those who have been severed from the power of sin. It's important to understand that the typical believer is called a saint. This whole concept of church sainthood is a later development it's not biblical, but a biblical saint is one who's been sanctified by the righteousness of Christ. And so you're a saint, and I'm Saint Louis. <laughs> As God's holy ones, we are recipients of his grace and peace, and I will talk more about that in the coming weeks. But what a wondrous journey we're about ready to take. The book written to the Romans by the Apostle Paul is the clearest presentation of the gospel of God's righteousness there is. It is clear as to how you become a believer and it is clear as to how you live the gospel in your everyday life. And by way of application, if you're a young believer, how old, I would like to challenge you to memorize at least the first chapter of this book. Get together with your friends. Get together with your Bible study and challenge each other. Go over it, recite it, test each other. And I guarantee you it will give you direction and purpose in your life. And if you don't feel like you can memorize, at least read it and ask yourself, where is your Bible? Is it tucked away in a corner of a roof somewhere collecting dust, which your grandchildren find and bring to you and say, what is this? This is when you need to commit to discipleship. If you're not in a growing discipleship group or leading a growing group, you need to do that. This is the time of year to do it. Let us know. Now, the Lord's table is an ordinance given by Christ to make sure that we don't forget about the peace and grace that we have. We're going to find that the bread represents the fact that the Son of God took on human flesh to come here to live holily so we could see it, and then to take our place upon the cross for the penalty of sin. He was crucified, and his life was flowed out, symbolized by the cup, which is away our sins. And on top of that, he raised, rose from the dead, conquered death, and gives us resurrection power. However, just because Christ was sacrificed and raised does not automatically mean that everyone in this room is covered by the blood of Christ. You have to receive it. And Romans is going to tell us how to do that, and we can't wait until then, so I'm going to read it now. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all it takes. Have you come to that place? where you have admitted your sin and the utter righteousness of God and his right to judge sin and his mercy to judge his son instead of you. If you recognize your sin, you just call out to him from your heart, dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I know your son was not and that he took my place so that I can rise and live. That's what faith is. There's no work you can do. You just believe. But if you're already a believer then I ask you the same question asked earlier. Have you experienced a time when you said to God that you would rather be his slave than to have all the riches in the world? As we prepare to take communion, let us do it with this understanding. You are now called by God to live in a way that the gospel should rise to the horizon of your life and dictate everything that you do. You are a slave to Christ, desiring to live as a constant herald of his grace. There's a man named Jim White of the Navigators that tells of a man named William Nyganda who lived and ministered in Africa. And people used to say that Nyganda was the godliest, most holy man they ever met. And so Jim visited Africa with his family, and he saw a man walking on the road as he was getting close to his destination. And he pulled over, and he said, pardon me, are you William Naganda? And he said, yes, I am. Who are you? And he said, well, I'm Jim White, and you don't know me, but I know your brother, and I've been praying for your ministry for years now, and I always wanted to meet you. And so Naganda got in the front seat, and they talked for a while, and then he turned around and very deliberately looked right into the eyes 
of his five-year-old daughter and said, hello, little girl, what's your name? Valerie, she said. And then he said, Valerie, do you love Jesus? And she answered, uh-huh, in a small voice. And after a few minutes, Naganda dismissed himself and he left. And Jim White says, I started the car and we drove on. And for the next few minutes, the rarest event in the White family history occurred. Five minutes of total silence. And then very shyly, Valerie crawled out up into her mother's lap, looked in his wife's eyes, and said, Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be a woman of God. You see, it was the transparency of this man's life, his total focus upon wanting to know how the gospel is affecting somebody that marked a five-year-old child. And so as the elements are passed here, Pray that the remainder of your life would be used to spread this gospel and that it would always be on the forefront of your mind as we prepare to sing. Father, as we come before you at this table, we can't help but think of the theme of Romans. We pray that we will have a spirit of humility and that you will raise some of us up in the power of your Holy Spirit, to be like Augustine and Wesley and the Haldane brothers. Thank you for sending your son to pay for our sins that we might go free.
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. take and eat together. Thank you, dear Lord, for the precious blood of our Messiah. We ask that you embolden us to live for him as he died for us. Help us to keep the gospel on the horizon of our lives, and may it dictate all that we do from this day forward. In Christ's name. Let us drink the cup. Shall we stand as we get ready to depart? Our Father, I do pray for this body, everyone that's here and everyone that couldn't be here today, that you will give us a revived understanding of the gospel, and that we would declare it even if it cost us our lives because we know that there is nothing more important in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.